Do you want the opportunity to go to the Richmond Fishing Expo? The Richmond Fishing Expo is the largest fishing expo in the area. It runs from Friday, January 20th through Sunday, January 22nd. And we have some special news. We're going to be there providing live coverage. And to celebrate this, we're giving away free tickets to our listeners. If you would like an opportunity to play, I'm giving you two ways that you can do it that's absolutely free. Go to Apple Podcasts and leave a review of Fishing the DMV podcast. And at the end of your review, just put the hashtag Fishing the DMV and you had a chance to win. The contest will start Tuesday, January 10th and runs through Wednesday, January 18th, with the winners being announced Thursday the 19th. On every video that dropped, in the comments section, just put the hashtag Fishing the DMV. Now here's a caveat. It's every video. So if you miss one video, I'm not going to be able to count you. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and we got a really cool special guest on today. We got Tyler Hypole on. Tyler, did I say that right? Yep, yep. So as good as it gets. <laughs> well, you know, I try to do my best, but as you guys know, if you watch this channel or Spirits and Ghost Stories, I suck with names so bad, just so bad. Uh, t- Tyler, how did all this happen? Like, how did I, how are we here now talking? Like, you want to tell the story from your end about how this conversation, you know, was able to come to fruition? Yeah. So, man, it must have been sometime last spring. I was just like whacking them on Anna. And I don't know what happened. Something with your SEO is good because I don't know what I was looking up. And I saw fishing the DMV and I was like, oh, I'm listening to this. And then, you know, I've been kind of keeping a tab on it. And, you know, you have some people that I either know of or actually know on. And I was like, yeah, I'll just, you know, reach out, say, talk fishing. You know, that's easy for me. Um, and then, yeah. So, but here we are now and, you know, happy to be here. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, I, you know, I had Jason Prog on and, and, you know, that episode just released and and he was shocked when he, in the comment section, one video was like, you know, I want to talk about Deep Creek Lake. I live up here. And I was like, sure. It's like, you know, Mm -hmm. and they're shocked because it's like, well, I'm not a big name pro, but this is a local sports talk show basically for fishing. And so national pros probably are not going to know everything about a Lake Anna or a deep Creek Lake or these, these smaller places. You gotta, you gotta find the locals that live, breathe and eat that stuff. So anytime anybody got, wants to come on the show, that's a local, you know, I'll try to vet you the best I can. Um, but yeah, you're more than free to come on here. And, and you know, with that said, Tyler, like what got you into fishing Lake Anna? Like what's your history on it? So Lake Anna is actually new to me. So I'm born and raised in Northern Virginia. Um, I grew up like 45 minutes, like Southwest of, uh, of DC. Um, I didn't, I, I fished, you know, in high school and middle school. Um, I dabbled in college fishing, you know, I wasn't traveling the country like some of these people do. Um, but, but yeah, that, I, I mean, as far as I can remember, like for fishing for me is like from middle school onward, like that, that, that was just me. Like, and in, in when I was in high school, like in third period, I was fishing in my mind and just like waiting to get out of class basically and go fishing um yeah i didn't like grow up in like a fishing family per se like my brother was introduced to it i kind of like stumbled on it a lot of trial and error a lot of like you know john boat fishing a lot of like humble humble beginnings you know bank john boat that sort of thing and then uh got involved with you know some of the youth stuff um actually in warren county i don't know if they still have a team um but but it was like so it was still far away from me the closest team was like orange or warren um, so I was fishing for, for Warren County, a lot of good people that were like Bruce ring, Paul Thompson. Um, a lot of those guys, uh, actually, you know, I got to spend time with on the water, taught me a, a ton about what I know today. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how it all started. Well, what area of Virginia did you grow up in? Uh, so Gainesville, um, okay. yeah, like kind of between like Centerville and Warrington, right, right there off 66. Yeah. I, I grew up in, um, in Percival, Virginia. Well, we moved, we moved out to Percival from Vienna when I was, I think I was about 13, 14 years old. And then we got to join the, um, the Marshall. It was at the time it was, it didn't last very long, but the Marshall, uh, bass fishing club. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, we would do, you know, again, you go to like Lake Frederick, you go to the course Potomac river, things like that. Yeah. Um, and, and from there, how did you get into the high school thing? 
Yeah, so that actually um, started with uh, my brother Jake and uh, another angler taught me a lot named Jeff Patch. Uh, so they were into fishing, you know, they did it. And I, I can't, I was like 12, I picked up a rod and um, just kind of got in it from there. We we're like researching what's the closest club, that sort of thing, found Warren County. Um, but no, it's kind of, I guess it's kind of a funny story too. So like, I remember going to my, my first tournament, I'm maybe a year or two into like fishing, like really just like, you know, like reading the, the Bassmaster magazine doing like, you know, that typical thing you hear, like the person who's really becoming, you know, really like indulged in everything fishing. And I, uh, I showed up to like my first tournament with like a spinning rod with like one bait, like that's it. Like just no idea what i'm doing i'm like going out in this big lake like i'm just like i'm just gonna cast and like watch these people like that's that was my biggest message people like when you are new to fishing like watch the person next to you is a little better like I'll always you be smoked him didn't you <laughs> you absolutely so, smoked him. <laughs> so that yeah and i guess like to get deeper into that story is you know i i remember even like some people you know kind of like laughing huh, like that like the kids that you know grew up in the fishing families and all that and you know i took that to heart and i remember so it was like the following year i won like angler of the year for virginia in like 2011 and i was like i that's all i needed was just to go there one time and go oh, okay just needed that little bit of motivation and and go and figure out and that next year i smoked them that year and i did not that year i i learned what changed then like from going from one rod one reel sort of speak pun intended there to <laughs> um going to like you know angler of the year um time on the water uh, i mean you hear that like it's like the most cliche thing in fishing but it's the most true thing and like even like when we get into anna later like you'll hear the same thing it's just time on the water i i think i went there realized i really don't know what i'm doing yeah i can go to like a pond or whatever that i fish after school or the lake after school and i can catch them but when i go out on anna or the, it was always anna potomac and like one other spot it was always the three the same three spots when when i did the youth stuff but when you go out there you you get humbled i mean you realize this isn't my backyard anymore you know th there's a lot that goes into that but i think i just approached it different i mean every every single day i mean anyone that you ask i was i i literally had a john boat in the woods and i carried a like a, a trolling motor battery and a trolling motor my rods my gear usually me and a buddy and like hiked half a mile down um through the woods and went out on a john boat till dark and it was like that on repeat i mean literally every single day probably from eighth grade and through you know high school and, and afterwards um until i got my buddy got a bass boat or you know or i and then i eventually got a boat and all that so you know that's how how i learned it wasn't and and I'm sure if you talk to people my age, especially from Nova, like fishing wasn't cool. Like I was like, I, I, I almost like kind of had it. And then when people found out I fish, like that was like my identity. And they, you know, it was like, oh, there's the the redneck who fishes. And I'm like, if I got to be a redneck to fish. I'm a redneck, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it is funny when people have that like that stereotype of a redneck, and we're in the richest yeah. area in the world. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's like yeah i mean hey i don't you can be called worse things whatever <laughs> i'm a redneck yeah. like, i like to fish that's that's but, true that's yeah. true so so then yeah. angler of the year like how, how did that all work out um yeah so so that's a lot man think about it. i'm like i think about that i'm old now or getting there because i'm that was like 2011 i believe so, what, 30 years ago four years something. <laughs> yeah 30, yeah <laughs> yeah so no i mean how did I'm trying to think of the first tournament of the year was the Potomac. It was like a fall thing in the Potomac, which the Potomac later became like my, my backyard too. I spent, I cut my teeth on the Potomac before anything else, um, any other big body of water. Um, and I think I just like limited out, like it was nothing special. Um, and then we went to like Anna that, and I had, I caught like, I got like second place on Anna. I had like big fish, um, uh, just like another you know small small limit when you look at it now but like when you're then it was it was a good limit for like that age group and what people were putting out um and then the last one was the chickahominy it was either the lake or the, or the river i can't remember which one um i got like i think i got second on that one as well so i had like a th like a three and two seconds or something because there's only three tournaments back then i'm not super familiar with the format now um, but it was like the three qualifiers and it was like a third, a second and a second. Dude, and that's then, like, impressive. 
and then big fish at two of them um which kind of goes into my like when i think of of something of myself as an angler is it's like bigger fish is like i'm not i'm not specifically target them but just seems like what i end up doing i I, i'm putting myself in a position to get a bigger bite or two um so yeah I, i did that that was probably my best year and then i think i fished like two more years and and uh the youth youth stuff after that and i was always like second or third and like the aoy points um and uh and then after that and this is no disrespect to anyone i fished against because they're all great a lot of them still are great but now i know it's a lot more competitive so at the time i had i kind of was like i'm kind of like done with this i want to go and i started fishing like abas and stuff like as soon as i could basically and trying to get into um like the fishers of men and like get like a partner um with uh some of uh some of the older guys and stuff so i think i i was done with the high school like my junior year of high school that's when i started you know looking into the, the bigger tournaments how, how did you go from that to tech then like like that bridge of did you i mean because again college fishing was a lot different way back then you know mm-hmm. in that era than it is now i'm um, fishing the abas where you get to actually fish for money which is kind of cool and there's pros and cons to that then you mm-hmm. go to tech and tech being a bigger school even at the time yeah was it structured like it is now where it's not like congratulations you're on the team you just go to the big events did you have to win certain internal competitions to be able to be selected for a bigger event how did all that work so i i actually went someone you had on so ryan fee and i actually i was i'm like i think i'm three years older than him or so, so i still was there when he was on the team for like one of the years where he actually got the fish because then covid literally ruined kind of everything for yeah. everyone that year um but it was kind of the same thing i mean really you have to know someone or you have to have a boat i mean that's kind of how it goes i mean if you go out there and and you know it's obvious that you're the best co-angler i mean people are going to know that and see that uh, it's just networking and and for me i um Act to bridge that gap between there so there was a lot like when i fished like aba and and all those things like i, I was kind of saving up and i i used to like cut grass and stuff to save up to buy money to buy a truck and buy a boat like that was like kind of my little side hustle so when i was when i went to tech i realized i need to have a boat if i want to like fish here and i was like i bought a boat in college which you probably don't hear most people say and i don't really recommend it because it was a lot more stressful than like at some times it was fun but um but yeah so i bought a boat and i was like i knew from the beginning like this i'm not gonna you know i'm not driving to california you know i'm not you know i'm not nolan minor you know <laughs> i'm not going to alabama new york and do all that like, you know i'm not it's just not like i just wasn't able to do that um i actually fished his uh his high school partner was actually my partner my first three really and, yeah oh. um so so you know, I'd see him at some of the events. Like I fish like Norman, a few a few of those events. And what was your first but, boat? Uh, so it's the boat I still have now. Uh, well, I used to fish out a John boat. I kind of built like my own John boat for a while and, and fish some stuff. But I have a RT 188 um, Ranger. So it's a it's only, it's like a 2014. Still, it's a, it's a great boat. I mean, it's a, it's aluminum. It, it does like everything I want to. Do. It's like 18 and a half foot. Perfect. that's uh yeah so i think i think the college thing is like you you know there specifically i know there's other colleges and do it different but at tech it's pretty much you know in the in the team tournaments you got to either prove like hey i'm a you know good enough co-angler like let me fish the bass events with you the or the mlf or you just have to you know have a boat be lucky enough to have a boat which obviously being a college kid i mean you know it's not the easy either something happened before that or you grew up in a fishing family so but there's still opportunity for everyone to fish. What changed? How did you evolve from high school into the college realm when it comes not only to just the mental side of the sport, but also your skills when it comes to techniques and stuff? Yeah. So technique wise. So I grew up where I grew up fishing is, um, I, I won't name it, but if you know where I live, you probably have an idea uh, of a, of a lake that I went fishing at. And, uh, I was lucky enough to live by this lake. And uh, on this, like, you can throw anything and teach yourself anything. Uh, so I was always versatile as an angler, or at least felt versatile, where I can go shallow, I can go deep, I can throw deeper baits. Um, 
and I can, you know, I can find fish offshore or, or any sort of thing like that. So I kind of already had that going for me. Um, and then when I went, so there was a time like my junior year, probably from when I was like 16 until onward, all I did was fish the Potomac. So I kind of became a river rat, learned how to read tides, learned how to run tides as best as I could. <clears throat> um, so, so then I went from fishing the Potomac mainly, and then I go to tech where, you know, I'm any body of water mat and I can see the bottom and like 20 foot of water. So it, it a little completely different. changed. Yeah. <laughs> but, but again, like, you know, like drop shotting and all that stuff wasn't like new to me. So that, I mean, like just being a tournament fisher, I feel like you should know how to drop shot because you're going to need it at some point. Drop um, shot, shaky head. I mean, it cashes checks. It doesn't necessarily yeah. win a championship, but it cashes a check. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, if you're like, it's just one of those things that it's like always tied on just, if you need five or something and and that so i i'd say evol evolving it went from like the river when i was first learning the potomac like that was like I, that river will beat you up if you don't know like what <clears throat> what you're doing out there i mean it'll all it'll literally kill your boat too if you don't know what you're that, doing that too yeah <laughs> yeah so so yeah there was kind of there was some time there where i i, I fished like the aquacon reservoir and a john boat too um a lot and, and then the potomac and then i went to tech and i'm fishing all this you know deep water clear water stuff so i kind of had to like slowly get myself back to you know fishing the small swim baits the jerk baits the drop shots the shaky heads uh ned rigs like all, all that all that stuff and that's actually what i'm more comfortable with because that's kind of how i learned i kind of learned how to be a vanessa fisherman and then i kind of spent like five years where i was like flipping throwing chatter baits frogs like all the typical river potomac stuff well if you, if you grow up in this area and you don't fish like the potomac or, or maybe aquaquan we'll throw aquaquan in there a little bit those two places you really are a finesse guy first i mean i'm thinking yeah. about all the electric motor only places around like your area like hunting run for an example or up in my area you got the shenandoah upper potomac susquehannock conica jig like all those areas up there sleeters lake like they get pressured. It's small world and it's like light line. And you do, and if you're fishing a pond, it's probably gonna get beat to death. So you really do learn how to fish pressured waters, light line, first and foremost, excluding like two fisheries, maybe. Um, and, and with the skill sets that you were growing and you developed, like, I mean, how did your high college career go from fishing? Uh, as far as fishing wise, like, again, I, I only fished like, club tournaments mostly <clears throat> and like they were all right like i don't know i probably caught a limit on most of the club tournaments like looking back or i think like and we fish clater all the time uh, oh, that makes it, that makes you a better angler but yes, um we used to like, vacation there as kids oh really? yeah. yeah i mean they're they're in there it's just like not you know you can't just like show up to clater on a tuesday and think you're gonna whack them and uh so yeah i mean like club tournaments stuff like that and I fished like one of the big events in like Norman and got like, and like we did all right after the first day. Like, you know, we weren't like, you know, sitting up there raising trophies and stuff. And I only fished a handful of them. And I think when I came into it too, because I was only there for two years. So I transferred to tech and I was like, so I only had two years really to fish. And then COVID messed up the year I graduated. So that, that first year I was, it was more of like an adjustment and like realizing, like I knew these guys could fish and everything. And, and like, and people will be surprised too. Um, just like the leap, if you go from high school to college, like it's, it's, it's different. Like the high school now is really competitive. The people in college don't really play around. Um, and so you have to be, if you really are, you know, invested in it, like, like for example, like Nolan was like, you know, everyone knows no, like Nolan from around here. Um, you know, you're going to do well because he, he was totally invested. He's a smart, he can go on a body of water and figure it out quick which when you're, you know, jumping around the country and you're fishing almost like a halftime elite series schedule, you, you kind of have to be able to do that. Um, and for me, it was just like COVID ruined it. It was my first year. I didn't really, like I had a partner who I had met down there, but like we weren't really, never really got time to like be on the same page because like that's also important too, like your partner, especially when you get to college and high school, you need to, you need to really be like the same unit. Like there's guys that I grew up fishing with that, I can go in the water and like we can use like five words and we're on the same page and like we know what each other's doing and that's like really important in team tournaments me personally and it's not because like i'm like i'm not like telling my co-angler to shut up or anything like i'll listen to anything i personally 
like would have done better in that situation going out by myself and, and just worrying and know, doing what I know how to do. And, and, you know, and that's just like, I'm sure some people will tell you the same thing. It's just like, sometimes you have a partner and it, it's just communication and just and making sure you're on the same page. A, a good partner is like finding a good, a good spouse. It really is. Uh, yeah. it, it's so hard because it's being able to, like you said, being able to communicate and learning when to listen to him and when not to listen to him. You know, the partner that I had, like that was the one thing where we had different skill sets. So it kind of helped where we, we would be practicing doing completely different things and it cuts down the water, mm. but come the game day, it's making those audibles that can be the issue where you two are fist fighting about what to do next uh, yeah. and then pushing yeah. the boat left or right. And I think that's the one thing that's nice about, you know, just being yourself in the boat a lot of times is, yeah, you might stick with a plan, but on the flip side, you don't have anyone else to steer you in the right direction. So it's like, I don't know. It, it's, it, it, it's, interesting. Yeah. it's really unique. Yeah, it definitely takes like some getting used to. And, and it goes down to like your style too um, and what you're comfortable with. And, and that's kind of like, like I said, like some of my buddies that I, I fish team tournaments with all the time that I grew up with, like it's just like you're on that same page all the time. And, and it's, and the other person trusts you. If you say, we're going to go do this, you don't even have, you don't have to explain why. Where if mm -hmm. you're fishing with someone for a new point, you might like, especially when egos get involved and all that stuff, you have to kind of explain you know, why, why we're going to do this and, and why not. So I think like, just as far as your fishing skill goes, being able to communicate when you get to, to like college and having a partner that like you're comfortable with is almost as important as, you know, actually being able to put them in the boat sometimes. No, hundred percent agree with that. I, I really do. And guys, again, like when you're going out there into college or you're fishing your like local tournaments, you know, having proper communication with your partner and getting the right partner that's a good fit that you trust. And they can, they kind of balance out your skill set. Um, because if you guys are both just chatterbait anglers, guess what? You're not bouncing a lot of ideas off each other because you're both mm -hmm. going to say like, let's just throw the chatterbait. And so you're going to have lulls, you know, in your skill set. Now, you know, piggybacking off your, your, your college career, was was there any places outside of Virginia that you got to fish that really stuck out to you that you enjoyed? Uh, yeah. So I I was mainly in Virginia, but I have fished tournaments on like you know the Sandy Cooper Lakes. Um, you know I've been to High Rock Lake, a bunch of like the North Carolina lakes. Um, even this past summer I was like in New York. Oh, cool. Um, so so I, I've gone to a bunch of different places but as far as like actually fishing in college I, I did basically just stay in virginia and then i went down to norman for like one of the big bass events um but yeah i mean out of all the places that i guess i've been or traveled to uh, my favorite santa cooper i mean that's it's literally insane it's it's the best fishery like i've probably ever been on hands down and it's just like a ton of fun and fits and it's like being on a as far as structure wise, it's like you feel like you're on the Potomac, but you don't have to worry about tides. And also the fish are like 10 pounds. So it's it's fun. That's a bucket place for me. Norman is also a bucket place for the wintertime specifically, because that is like a fun like I hear when it comes to just learning and crafting your dock skills. Oh, yeah, that's a uh, that's what we went out. My uh, me and um, my buddy for that college tournament. I mean, it was it was basically a winter turn. I think it was in February. So I mean, it was still winter. It's a power plant lake. So it was still like kind of warm, but um uh we just got the worst like we got like the worst weather you can imagine i mean it was like 30 something degrees and just oh. tor torrential downpour and for like the two day tournament and i was like thinking i was like after the first day i was like we could actually get in and fish like the final day uh and then the second day i was like i don't know do i want to <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. I but like not actually you know if i was you know i would have <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll suck it up uh, super cold sleet rain it is almost like i just donate i'm just gonna donate the entry fee screw it like that's the it, one thing yeah snow like anything other than that like cold rain when it's like 30 degrees and like snow anything i'd way rather fish in than that yeah it, it was bad no I, I, yeah yeah i i don't think i've ever fished in a snow turn no actually i lie we did a uh, i think it was a potomac team series and it was, I think it was like the first week of March it was. And it was like, it was, it snowed the day before it was below freezing gale force winds and everything was blown out. So we said, screw it. We're going to, we're going to commit and go to blue plains. And there was a small crash advisory warning. The tournament was still on. 
it was so bad when the water would hit your body, it would automatically freeze. Yeah. And it took us two hours to get there driving slow. And we ended up coming in second place by like an ounce going up there, catching just four fish and like more than half the field like died. And it was the absolute, I just, I told myself if it's like that again, it's just not worth it. It's not even fun yeah. at that point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, unless they're depending, like it would have to be a big tournament, big stage or something for me to like, be like, all right, I'm about to just go get pelted by sleet for like two hours. Yeah. It's like fish. I won 300 bucks. I destroyed my lower unit and I got frostbite. Yeah. So that was, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah. from tech, um, what did you get your degree in again? Uh, so multimedia journalism, and then I like minored in international relations. That makes sense for uh, Northern Virginia then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So then you wanted to move back to this area after tech. That was kind of the plan. Um, yeah, I was kind of open to everything, but it's kind of, once you're like in the Nova area, it's hard to leave just with, you know, how it is with like job opportunities and different stuff like that. And I'm also, I'm just born and raised here. Like Nova's just my home. I live actually closer to Lake Anna now. I live the the furthest away from home oh well, blacksburg was the furthest but now i've i live like you know two hours of where i where i grew up so so two hours from where you grew up but then how far from uh like anna like 30 30 minutes and then the year before that i was literally 10 minutes away um so i work from home so i just had i was like i'm you know we're gonna go move next to a lake gonna go fishing every day basically Oh my God. You live the dream there. The remote yeah. waking up and having a lake right there is, is literally heaven. Yeah. That's how it was. That's why, I mean, that's why I was saying last spring, like March to June. I, I mean, I, I know for a fact, cause I know all the ramps. I know Dave and all the guys on there. I was, I was the one out in the water. The, like, there was no one on Lake Anna more than me for like four months. I can't believe you had to move away. That sucks almost. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm still close, but I'm not like, close enough where it's like worth going every day before it was like oh like i'm done with work to the lake uh saturday sunday 12 hour days dark to dark on the lake so then you know as, as we get into lake anna here um i want to really just like compare and contrast it like is there any similarities with lake anna to like a smith mountain lake or a lake norman or is it just a complete unique fishery it's it's it has similarities but it's unique um it's a weird fishery i think growing up like when you, i heard the word anna i was like afraid like i didn't want to fish there it was it used to be terrible it's it, in my eyes but now it's like on the up and up like you can just go out there and i mean you can you have the especially coming up soon i'm going to be cold and fishing a lot coming up and you're going to have the potential out there soon to catch 20 maybe th a 30 pound bag and that's not really a joke like the the fish that i saw cruising I probably saw like multiple 30 because I was out there so much. You understand? I was like a part of the lake for a couple of months. You were a so, part like, of the lake. <laughs> I, mean, I, I was like, I, I literally was like, I was naming the fish and everything. And I, I mean, you would go out there some days and I mean, you would just see them cruising and stuff during that like cruising phase. And, and you're like, that's a 30 pound bag. Like, I just watched a 30 pound bag swim right by me. And you're just like, what is going? Like, where am I? Like, I'm not in Florida, I'm not in Santa Cruz. I'm, I'm in Lake Anna. So, it's such a um, weird, it's such a weird lake, because like, so guys, if you guys don't know it, you know, what, let me just bring it up here so we can show the whole world. You know, if you're living under a rock, if you're one of my Tennessee listeners or my New Jersey listeners, um, I, some people call this like the Dead Sea. Oh, there we go. Some people call this the Dead Sea. Uh, lake Anna is a nuclear powered lake well it's not actually the nuclear power there's a nuclear power generator on the lake mondays mm -hmm. i tell you um what makes this really interesting though is it's probably about ten thousand acres plus if i'm not mistaken but there's three major levee systems that cut the lake off to what they call the public side and the private side it's also mm -hmm. known as the warm water side and the cold water side um and it, it's almost a shame because if somebody would just be nice enough to blow all three of these things up, that lake would be massive. It really would yeah. be a nice place to hold bigger tournaments. But because of it, it does cut the lake down. And yeah. then, Tyler, I mean, you can talk to this. It is a fantastic lake generally throughout the year. But between like the Memorial Labor Day time, the amount of boat traffic yeah. is insane. Yeah, that's why I went to New York. <laughs> 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 It's like, I, I mean, uh, so a lot of the tournaments I fish, it was kind of after that. Um, 
Dave over there at, at the Fishtails. He puts on a good little Sunday series there. So I started doing that, but I mean, the tournaments there, uh, you're out at like 5 a. It's like 5 or 6 a.m. to 11. So he, he does like a five-hour tournament cycle once it's out there. And it's it's not because, you know, the anglers are lazy. It's because it's literally not safe. So, like, mm-hmm. it, it can literally, especially if you're going up towards the splits. So you come out, you know, the bridge. It's always, you know, you hear a lot like, am I going left or right today? There it is. Um, yeah. And if you go right and you go up towards those splits, things get really narrow and people there, I, I I've almost got hit like it's not an exaggeration. I almost got hit by like a wake boat this year. So like it, it's really is like a dangerous place if you don't know it and you're not paying attention. It's not dangerous because of you, it's dangerous because of others. And um especially up in there, it gets real real tight, real narrow, and you know, people are just having a good time and don't don't care that you're trying to catch a fish. I fished a kayak tournament there, I think it was Lord, I think it was like May. And and once I think ten ish rolled around. Dude, it was like you had to have your head on a swivel because if a wake boat came around and you get like multiple wake boats just doing donuts and like you could easily just be in the drink. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's no joke there. It really is. I mean, it's like a different lake. You go out there in like February, March or whatever, and it's like this is the most peaceful lake in the world. You give it like a few months and you're out there and it's like party city. So, you know, fishing fishing there in the summer is is hard definitely recommend going like early early or late late or, or night fishing that's good night fishing late. or the winter time and, and you know guys it, you know it's it's december now it's winter winter is coming um and you know lake anna is famous for its winter series too that's held i believe out of sturgeon creek marina on on sundays generally speaking um Tyler, what is Lake Anna like in the wintertime? Like give us first like a broad stroke over a broad brush stroke overview of this place. Yeah. So in in the winter, um, yeah, I have I've fished there in the winter and I, I did actually a lot the, the, the year prior. And um it, it sets up kind of funny because there, it, it is a power plant lake. So you have like a section of it that does stay a lot warmer than the other. So you'll get like a lot of the bait schooling there. Um, you can go there and and catch fish around that that generator it, it is typically a little bit warmer right there um and, and you know they're pretty you'll find them schooled up there um it, it's actually kind of weird too because you'll still catch fish shallow there i mean you know you hear that in like the winter but like i mean you can go fish like relatively shallow so like uh, some people you know talk to river people you say like five foot and that's like deep or like you talk to lake people and that's shallow so like a dock or whatever they'll sit on those pilings and stuff on docks still in like five to like ten foot like we had a good day just like drop shotting dock pilings one winter and it was like oh this is like no different than if i was like fishing in the summer so there's like some parallels with with how the how they'll set up between winter and summer on that lake um they obviously i mean just like typical winter stuff like it they're they're a little sluggish they're not going to be as aggressive and usually when you find one a, a good one in the winter there and this is kind of true with everywhere in my opinion it usually means there's more nearby. Um, It usually means they're there for a reason because they're not making, you know, huge movements, you know, one up up shallow down deep. They're kind of staying uh, close to like vertical cover, you know, stuff where they have stuff going over their head, whether it's like a a bluff, um, some main lake stuff or docks or something like that. Something that's easy, easy for them to move, but you'll find them surprisingly on that lake more than like when I go to, you know, like Smith or something like that. Um, doing like just like weird like shutless like why are you there kind of thing like so they're all over but if you want to catch like your big piles of fish you're going to be having to use your electronics you're probably going to graph what uh, a lot of what you're fishing that was kind of the best like a demiki rig or drop shot or something like that um and, and they're there and the winter time is like a great time to to catch really really big bags out of anna because when you find one good one it's usually around a couple others for people that want to travel down from like the DC area to fish it in the winter time, what area of the lake, if you had to section it off, do you think people should start looking at first? Uh, so th- I think that's personal preference, but for me, I'm always going down towards the dam. Um, I, I, I actually, so I'm going, if I'm coming out and I'm going left, I'm going, I'm going down there. Yeah. Always, uh, always down there for me in a tournament situation. That's just my personal preference and my experience on there. Um, why? And it all, um you know i just went i think one day i went right and it didn't feel right and i went left and i and i caught them and then i just expanded on it and there's a lot more to expand on down there like you look it's pretty intricate it's got a lot 
a lot of coves going on, creeks, um, you know, some mainland pockets. It's got some of those uh, those riprap walls that breaks up the hot from warm side. Um, you, the herring are more prevalent down there, in my opinion, um, moving around so you can get on a herring bite. Um, and then up when you go up, it, it feels more like you're river fishing. Uh, when you go up, especially towards the splits, it gets dirtier there. Um, if the sun's say if it if it's muddier water and we get like a warm front or something and it's like hitting you know hitting the water pretty good then i'm probably am gonna go up towards the splits uh just because that muddy water is gonna warm up quicker and you'll probably get more bites shallow um if i don't want to like sit on my electronics all day and try to find like a pot of fish a school of fish all day where i'm graphing like for three hours and fishing for like another a couple other um but for me preference wise like i'm i'm probably going down that way also that is where the uh the water stays a little bit warmer that's right where that uh that reactor is how important is bait fish when it comes to winter time patterning um versus docks and stuff like you, you talk about blueback chasers and i know if you're down at like a lake hartwell lake murray some of those vaunted blueback herring lakes it's all about the blueback's yeah where is lake anna is it at that scale where mm -hmm. all they do is check okay I don't think so. It might, it could be eventually. Um, for me personally, I know there's some people that literally, well, like the blueback bite is like, they're going out there and like, they're just going to chase that. Um, I've always looked at it as like a bonus. Um, Cause like I'll be fishing something else and then the blueback will start breaking. And then I'm like, like, I, so I always have, especially depending on the time of the year, I always have like a jerk bait or a top water on for that. And that's happened multiple times this year. I mean, like they're breaking or the bluebacks are going crazy and you like turn around and like throw a walking bait and then you just like catch a three pounder and you're like, okay. <laughs> so like, and I mean, seriously, if you go out there enough, like it will happen to you. Cause some people you tell them there's herring there and they're like, what? So like, it's still not that prevalent, but they're there for me. It's just like a bonus. And that's probably the better way to look at it, especially if you end up fishing tournaments down, down South in pure blue black lakes. And, and the guys that win it, they say what they usually do is they pick an area where there's a lot of local fish. And you can fish around that one area, catch your local ones. And then every now and then the blueback will come in because yep. then you're not relying on that bite. And because guys, if you don't know about it, it's hard because, you know, think about the biggest ball of bait that's about six to 10 inches long. And they're just like little tuna is just, just pelagically just swimming around everywhere. And so if you time it right, you can basically have your winning sack in about five casts. But if you don't, you're screwed. And, and so being able to balance that out, and I'm glad you brought that up about it's a bonus if they show up. You're, you're not, I saw, and I messed up the first time I went to Lake Murray and it's like, I would just bounce around point to point, hopefully to time it right. And mm -hmm. I didn't do that very well. I just, I didn't time it up right. The other day where I said, I was just going to lock it in and just fish a jig and a shake head. All of a sudden they came by for some reason, boom, I caught a couple extra. So it, mm -hmm. it is an interesting timing deal, almost like tides, so to speak, except you can't sit your watch to it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's always random too. Like it was, I think probably the craziest thing me and my buddy, we had finished like the Sunday series there and that's all local guys. Like I, I honestly wasn't even comfortable fishing these tournaments until I was like, I need to get out there and spend some time. Cause like these guys are going to like, you know, they'll beat you up pretty bad. They're all, they, they fished there for their whole life. Most of them. Um, so that's kind of was my goal. I was like, I'm going to get back into competitive, but like first I'm going to spend the time necessary to go out there and know that I have a shot. And so like one of the tournaments that we, I think we had second and big fish nice. We're we're like, I caught, I have like, uh, it, was, it was five something, five, five. It was like the big fish of the tournament. And then literally like in this main like pocket right behind us, the, the herring just start going crazy. We're just like fill a limit. <laughs> it's just like that. Like you're just like, that was just like your time kind of thing. Like just couldn't really plan it. Just happened. So if, if you're not, if you're not generally targeting specifically like bait fish, what what mm -hmm. is your game plan are you just idling around looking for just differences in contours like is it a uh, let, me, let me expand on that in your experience is it a pattern lake or an area lake so that's another thing it's both uh, that's what i found Damn. so so it, it's it's both there's there's resident fish everywhere in that lake and that's how i got to like really you know i fished anna since i was like 12 years old but i never really like now when i go there it's not like you know am i gonna catch them it's like it, it got to the point where I'm confident to say like, how many am I going to catch? Like, am I going to place? Like, am I going to like that sort of thing, especially if I'm going there competitively. Um, and that just took like spending the time there to be like, Oh, this section of the lake. Cause not all of them have it. There's resident fish here and they're good fish. Um, and then also 
what I've noticed is like you can find this area, you know, a lake within a lake, if you want to say that, and then break that down and you'll find a pattern within that little section of those resident fish. So you can pattern these resident fish. And, and I did that on a specific part of the lake. It's like probably my favorite part of the lake now. It's it's literally incredible. And I was going there and I was like, why are, no one comes here? I don't understand. It's a spot where I told you, I was like, there's there's 30 pounds just cruising right here. <laughs> there's there, and it's it's like, so you can break it down and fish these resident fish, but you can also find patterns. You can jump around a little bit. I, I definitely did that like in the pre-spawn, just like windblown point type stuff. Like it was like an over one and I just grab a jerk bait, go to you know the secondary point on whatever creek facing that way that was, you know, had the most wind on it, throw a jerk bait, you catch one or two. So like that's like what I would say. You could run that pattern and you could catch five easy. Um, uh, let's yeah. expand on that because I thought that was interesting. So I got this right here. So when you say a lake within a lake, let me pick. Mm -hmm. Merp. All right. Let's say this is probably about the mid lake area. So are you saying like you would consider all this just one section as a lake within a lake? Or are you breaking it down even smaller and saying like, I'm going to treat just this area as a lake within a lake? Yeah, so I would say you see what I'm not saying? To, yeah, no, I'm trying to like I'm trying to tell you without being like, this is my spot. Well, let's, <laughs> but, let's do the warm but, let's do the warm water but, side uh, because unless you're like hopping the dike. Yeah. Uh, okay, so like so yeah. if you take this, are you considering this whole area a lake within a lake? Or are you basically breaking it down more and saying, No, I'm just gonna work on the back of this cove and that's my lake within a lake? So bigger than that. So I would say if you were to like even if you go back to the other side, I'm kind of messy. You can, if we mark my spot, it's okay. It's just like if you were to grab two points or whatever on the main lake and you were to like draw a line and then everything inward. So kind of like a bigger section, I would say. So yeah, like, like like something like that. Like I break right. it down like a little bit bigger than that. And I try to, you know, roughly something like that size. And I would say, okay, there's fish here. I, I mean, that's the thing that you kind of have to tell yourself when you go out is there's fish there it's just you know are you willing to sit there long enough to figure out how those fish want to bite or do you want to go kind of do what you want to do and jump around so would you be more of like a thrift type of model where you're going to spend like five minutes on a spot and then you're gone or do you rather sit wait and make them bite like where do you think you're what's your vibe i'm like a madman until i figure <laughs> out something like my my brain is constantly like clicking and I, I can't shut it off and that's why i think fishing is so good for me because like, it's like an outlet for me um because i i mean i'm when i'm on anna especially when i was figuring it out now when i go there i'm relaxed because i'm like okay like I, you know i've done this a few times it's like fishing back home now um but yeah at first it was like for that first month, it was like into February and March where I was like t really like trying to test myself and, and like push myself to my limits is how can I figure this out and how can I learn? And that was through bouncing around and and listening to the fish. Like I, I don't it's it's hard to say, but anyone that spends enough time on the water, eventually you start listening to the fish and what they want versus, well, you know, I like jigs, so I'm going to go throw a jig. Um but yeah, and, and that's it's a hard thing to allow. I think it's just time on the water. The fish will tell you where they're going to be and what they want. And if you pay close enough attention to to them, especially during times like the spawn, post-spawn, um, and a, that, that's like a really interesting time of year. It's literally all over the place. Fish are post-spawn, pre-spawn, spawning all at the same mm -hmm. time. Um, so yeah, it's just time on the water and having the fish and, and looking at them and, and and literally physically i mean physically looking at them sometimes when they're cruising and spawning and you're like oh, okay so this is what they're doing are you know are on my graph okay in the middle of these pockets there's bait schooling up and i'm fishing the docks around it now i i need to stop doing that and start throwing something in the middle of the pockets or something like that or they're not in the pockets anymore but i'm casting on a dock and they're biting okay go fish start fishing dock like it's not it, it's really simple it sounds like listening to the fish sounds like some crazy like guru <laughs> type mm -hmm. type thing, but it's really just go fishing, eliminate water, which is probably the biggest thing. Like when I was going out in February, March, I was I was going out there to eliminate water and not catch fish just as much as I was to catch them. And I think that's like a hard concept, uh, especially for younger anglers to understand because, you know, catching fish is fun. But if you want to catch more, you kind of have to go out there, put your time in and go, oh, well, do, I'm not going to fish there. Do you ever 
this was interesting too. And I talked to Nolan when I had him on the show, I think it was the first time we had him on and I had my thoughts going into a kayak tournament and, and, and he hit words stuck in my head. My first two kayak tournaments that he said about like, it changes a little bit of the way how you fish because you can't just hammer down a 250 Merc and just fish the whole thing. Mm -hmm. You got to really like, fish an area and then i started to fish and i went to like it was like an tournament and i remember i couldn't pedal all the way because my feet were cramping or my legs were cramping i was like shit this is this is too much exercise and, mm -hmm. and so i was like okay i'm gonna pick, pick this area and it was like on the third swipe back through all of a sudden it caught him and it really opened my eyes to oh shit if i was on a boat there's no way in hell i would have fished this spot where i'd mm -hmm. go back and forth through it ever uh, <sighs> do you ever recheck areas throughout the day or is it once it's done you're you're done with that spot no i, I recheck especially if i have history on it or i know or if i go somewhere <clears throat> like it will drive like my i know it drives my dad crazy and like some of my other people where i'll go somewhere and i won't even cast and i'm like it's just not right i'm like what are you talking about <laughs> it's just like this area is it's just like we'll come back to it like that sort of thing so but i i do recheck areas a lot and i I think a lot of that is with like if you're on time in the water or like for example if it's like as plain as day when you see big fish cruising around you chances are they're there it's just you have to be willing to like know they're not ready to bite yet so let's go you know try this other thing and then we're going to come back maybe they'll set up a little time bit and settle down yeah and I think that's what's really that works so well with your system of, of, of cutting the lake down into smaller pieces because you can rerun the same water again until you get them to trigger. Um, yeah. and, and that kind of led to like, so if you're fishing the down lake part of Lake Anna, would it be a rarity or a norm for you to then like go all the way up to the split? Or are you pretty much saying like, if I have a tournament, this is my line and I'm fishing everything in here just to save time? Yeah, it's there's going to have to be like, something something bad had to happen or something or if i was if i'm all the way down there and i and i run up and i think a lot of that is just being comfortable with the lake if you were to like take somebody uh new to the lake or me even however many years ago and i'm fishing that that southern part down by the dam and i'm not getting bit am i gonna waste like i don't i mean like in a small but i don't know it's an hour you think about it it becomes like an hour you're wasting an hour especially if you're driving up to the splits um because you have to come back down and all that so that's that i wouldn't do it i'm probably just gonna ride or die basically by the decision that i made that morning in that general area like yeah i'm gonna bounce around i'm not gonna sit there and and be crazy and you know hope that it works on the 100th and 10th time you know but i'm not, as far as like anna goes if i pick a section I'm, I'm fishing it and that's why i i never went to the splits on any tournament all the ones that i cash checks in or any of that i went left and i and i stayed there um and there was times doing that tournament where like it was like oh, i should have went right and then eventually you, you kind of you know it happens it just eventually something falls into it no that's guys that's great advice and again please you know like and subscribe to the channel it really helps us out with the algorithm helps promote everything and then also you know link to tyler's information will be down below maybe you can even go out with him he can start his own guiding service on this lake uh it sounds like he's put his time in there uh winter series um have you ever thought about fishing it yeah so i haven't done it yet but since i've gone out there now and i spent the time um i'm, th I'm thinking about it you know i'm not a hunter but i'll, I'll freeze with a fishing pole in my hand uh you know, I'm not afraid of the cold and that, so I'm, I'm actually kind of looking forward to it. Uh, I think I'm going to go and give it give it a go, at least at least fish a couple this year and during the winter, because I think that's you're probably going to see like the biggest bag ever on Anna this winter, I'd assume, from what I saw this past spring. Like 20 pounds wasn't like that started becoming like kind of common once I figured it out, which was like it's weird to say for Anna. It's between it. So um, I don't know if you listened to it. We had John Odenkirk on the show and he talked about like the F1 stocking program that he's done there the last couple of years at Lake Anna. And I think it's between now and the next five years when those F1s also start gearing up and getting bigger. It's going to happen. We're having a dirty 30, you know, I'll put a dollar on it between now and five years out from now, there will be a dirty 30, multiple dirty 30s pulled out of there. Not just one guys. I'm talking multiple because it has the yeah. bait and it has the genes. And that's so important to have those genes in there. Yeah, what I what I saw this past spring just like blew me away. And I grew up the lake that I lived next to and grew up fishing on is like untouched 
gym and I, I, I went to Anna this past spring and just like what I saw I was out there so much, just the ones spawning, the ones cruising, the ones I caught, the ones I lost and everything. You, you, you were kind of just, um, it was amazing. It really was, especially after like fishing somewhere like Sandy Cooper and actually seeing like, you know, what a big fish factory really looks like. And you're, and you're seeing all these mm-hmm. around you're like, there, there's potential out here. Yeah, th- there is a lot of potential out there. It gets a lot of pressure, but it, there's a lot of potential. And, and so, and with that said, um, you t- what, what are a couple of baits that you like to throw in December on Lake Anna? Yeah, if I'm going out there in December, it's been kind of a weird fall. So I think we're we're almost working with like, I was catching fish in their summer pattern. So I'm hoping winter will probably be here pretty soon, December, January. Um, but one bait that I'm going to... Uh, a throw is, is like just a little small swim bait, like a little mm. Kai tech. I have the tail dyed right there. Um, just something that you can count down basically that, you know, you see, you graph fish. Um, and then also if I wanted to put like a bigger head, like the Mickey rig, just kind of drop fish, um, almost like you're crappy fishing, but yeah, definitely small little Vanessa swim bait, something I'm going to use in the winter. Um, this, I can't get out of my hand. So I, I I'm always cautious when I pick it up um a jerk bait I don't, I don't know what it is but in the winter it worked just as well um this is a six cents i i throw the vision 110s they're i mean like so i'm not like sponsored by them but those are just the best jerk bait in my mind i played around with a lot of them um you can also get the deeper ones uh really for me i just stay with like the normal vision 110 because with line size you can get those down a lot deeper than you think you can uh so i i just stay with that that normal vision 110 right there the jerk bait another one oh i'm sorry are you gonna say something no i was just gonna say um with the with the swim bait was that the specific color you use is is a does it look like a pumpkin seed or green pumpkin yeah i think that's just like a little green pumpkin okay um honestly i don't even know this is either a kai tech or one of the little strike king ones and just honest, like little little paddle tail. And honestly, guys, as you guys know, I'm not sponsored by a bait company or anything. It really doesn't matter when it comes to that, like a Kai Tech versus a Strike. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. All go with whatever's the cheapest when it comes to that. Yeah. Um, what what um jerk bait? What colors do you like to throw? Um. So on Anna, I like to throw the like blue. It's like a blue back herring color one, or the are just the blue back one as well. Um. But I'll also throw, especially in and still winter february february still winter it's starting to become spring it feels like like with temperatures in march and stuff but i'll throw one with red in it too um something with red you know just like that typical early kind of spring deal with red that seems to trigger fish so i'll throw one i don't know the specific color i'm not like that guy with like you know that knows like the color i wish i was because it would make ordering stuff a lot easier but, <laughs> but i gotta look at everything but the one that has like the red on like the gills and stuff um and that's like universal. I think I had the best day I've ever had fishing on Smith Mountain with that particular one, but also on the Anna. So pretty good on those, you know, on reservoirs. Anyway, there's kind of clear water. Anything else that you like to throw this time of year? Yeah, so just basic. Just this isn't even the specific jig or anything, but a jig. Um, you can't go wrong with a jig. I'd probably, for a lot of the stuff that I have seen, like in the summer and winter, I'd probably be throwing a football jig, like a three-fourths to half ounce, and just kind of dragging it really slowly. Um, this is after I'm graphing fish. I'm not, you know, not just going out there and, and typically throwing it. But if you are going to do that, I would stick to especially like main lake points on Anna. Um, there's some shoals that really drag out. Just get to the deepest, the deepest part of that shoal where it cuts into either like the main river channel on a channel bend or something like that. Um, but yeah, most of that if a football jig, it's usually because I went over something or saw like a brush pile that I have marked or I saw bait on something or the fish are like really, you know, hunkered down, which they will be in the winter. You'll see them. They're really, really close to the ground. Um, Why football? Then, Why a football? For me, it's just feeling. It's just I want to feel everything the best I can, which some, some of the jigs now with tungsten, you don't even really need it. But for me, I think it's just like, I think I could do the same thing with like a three, four ounce, like round ball, like made of tungsten or something. Um, for me, it's just like a comfortability thing where I'm, I know I'm going to feel everything. Um, was that a, was that a, uh, I went to tech and fish Smith and Clater all the time. So I got into football head. <laughs> Is that where that kind of came from? So the first time I fished a football head jig, I didn't even know it was a football head jig, but <laughs> I just thought it was a jig. Cause I, like I told you, like when I was young and you know, I was, just trial and error taught myself a lot when I was like 12 years old, 13 years old. 
Um, so I had fished them, and then I kind of figured out, oh, I, like this thing has a purpose. <laughs> it's shaped different, you know, feels around a little bit better, you know. They usually offer them in bigger sizes too, which I like. Yeah, I uh, the first time I ever learned how to swim a jig, it was actually I think a clater because I would I would pull it on the bottom and I would pop it off and try to reel in the cast, and they would bite it. And so I took that exact same jig and went to the tidal Potomac and started throwing it, and I caught a couple. And I never knew at the time I was in high school, like there was the, how that different heads work. So I was just swim jigging a football head, not yeah. knowing at all. And tell you what, it'll, that's still, it. Bite it. it'll still bite it, but God, it yeah. catches every weed. <laughs> yeah. It does. Comes out there like a plow. <laughs> just yeah. everything. I was making fantastic holes in the vegetation back then. Um, <laughs> so football jig. And then you, uh, before I cut you off, you said there was something else that you like to throw. There's yeah, one more thing. And this is just, yeah, I'll take one out. This goes, I'd say a, a, neg, a Ned rig too, but just like a drop shot. And I don't know. I, ju I just use these. I'm not like, it doesn't matter like time of year, season or anything. I just use these dream shots or like robo worms. Um, I've never, there's not like a specific bait, but a drop shot is you really just can't go wrong. Especially if you're in the winter and they are in deeper water and you're graphing them. Um, light line, that sort of a deal, you know, braid, fluorocarbon drop shot uh heavier weight i use sometimes I use a heavier weight than i think most people do especially in the winter just getting it down there quicker um but yeah i'd say that those are probably like the five baits that i'd be throwing if there was another one maybe i, I like to crank so if the water's a little bit warmer or we got like a, a warm front coming through i'm probably gonna go crank some rock what do you like for your uh, drop shot setup like rod line everything uh, so rod, I use like a seven two medium light uh, line. I use like eight to ten pound braid, and then I go all the way down. Depending on where I'm at, on like Smith Mountain, I'll go down like four pound line. Um, nice. And some, you know, but typically on like Anna, you can get away with like eight, even ten. I mean, for the most part. But mostly, I'd say on Anna, I'm throwing eight. That's interesting. So you think like, is it because Smith is more pressured or more clear? Is that why you go down to four there? Um, I don't know if it's more pre I mean, talk about another great lake that I don't think like a lot of people know about, um, uh, like outside of Virginia, the locals know, <laughs> but, yeah. um, but being at tech and stuff, like I just, I fished that a ton and I, I don't think it's like anything with, with pressure or anything. I think it's just clear water. Um, and, uh, you know, small mouth to visual, like visual feeders, a small mouth down there. I I'd, I've seen like my buddy's been throwing like eight pound and I've been throwing four and I'll have like, you know, two to his one bite or something. I do think there's something with that. I mean, Aaron Martin's really taught us about that, about line diameter and that playing a major factor in, in just getting bit sometimes, uh, which mm. I don't know why, but it's a thing. It definitely is. Um, yeah. Jig, jig rod set up. Jig rod. Um, so that kind of varies if I'm skipping it's something short. Um, like all these lakes in Virginia is just loaded with docks. So you kind of have to, if that's something you don't know, go out there and you're going to ruin a few spools, but teach yourself how to skip a jig. If it's that, it's like a six, eight medium heavy. Um, and then for my other jigs, I, man, I have too many rods. I'm trying to think probably like a seven, three medium heavy is a good all around jig rod. What's that's your favorite what rod though? Come on. What's your favorite brand? Um, I'm also all over the place with that. I used to be a big 13 fan cause they made good stuff for like the, like the Potomac they're based in like Florida. They made like good frog rods and stuff, but now I fish everything Shimano, um, hmm. pretty much everything Shimano. And like, I, I started training all my bait casters or like the new digital control stuff. I've been switching to those. I like those a lot. Those got to help with skipping. They do. They do. Yeah. Definitely worth the investment. If you're fishing docks a lot is to get a DC reel for sure. Did, did the Shimano switch have to do with tactical bassin? No, honestly, I, I've always been, I've never been like super loyal to like, like sometimes I would just like go to like a Cabela's or, or whatever, or, and just like feel a rod. It would be like, I don't even like, it'd be like, I, I couldn't even tell like a duck it or something. I'd be like, I just like the way this feels like just sit there, play with it. And like, okay, I'll just get this one. Like, a, you know, not one that has like every rod and reel looks the exact same. I'm starting to get that way. Cause I started really liking these DC stuff, but used to just be like all over the place. 
Now, Shimano's started to really step their game up, and they're making a lot of really, really good stuff. But they, when it comes to like a drop shot rod, that's something where it's like, guys, definitely splurge on a drop shot rod because it, the sensitivity is the biggest thing. Like, you, yeah. you need to be able to feel like the tail of that fish hitting that bait just because sometimes that bait is so mush. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it is for sure. I learned that a lot, too. I think I had – there was one point where, like, I had three rods and, like, only one of them was, like, design for a drop shot rod but i had like three drop shot rods on because they were just like eating it that good why i need to have three i don't know just because i guess you I, have to because yeah because i would break one off and i just grab the next one basically it was just like to save time and uh, but yeah the sensitivity like you'd feel like one one feels like a broomstick if you get a rod actually made for a drop shot like you're feeling everything it feels good it, it that yeah 100 percent preaching to the choir there um what is one thing looking back now that you really learned since day one fishing like Gannon to now, what is one thing that you could tell somebody that's never been there before? Yeah. If I was to tell someone to never go there before, and it's hard to say, cause like when you live so close to the lake, you can kind of take it for granted. Um, so if it was someone, you know, that had to make a drive or go there, uh, I, I would say depending on the time of year, just go and fish what you're comfortable with. Cause it really is like a versatile lake. Um, you know, if you're making a drive somewhere to Anna and like, you're like, I want to, you know, by all means, if you want to learn how to drop shot, I would say go down by the dam and it's just clear and better drop shot sort of, uh, you know, cover and everything and structure. And, and there's a lot more offshore stuff you can do. Um, but if you're making a trip there, there is a lot you can do. If you want to go right, you want to fish shallow, you want to flip docks, you can do that. You're going to catch fish. Um, and then if you want to, you know, if you want to fish offshore or you want to go fish some deeper stuff, um then go, then go left i'd say you know it offers a lot but and also don't and try to break down a section like i say you can do whatever you want but when you're sitting there you know you can really break this lake down you can do it with any lake you can pick like a mile stretch and you say i'm just gonna learn this stretch today nice and then you go you go back like you know next weekend you know i'm gonna learn this stretch and you start expanding on it and building off that and that's that's what i sat there and, and i did for for four months like hardcore you know i uh, lucky i still have like a girlfriend after after that i was on the water too much but but yeah i would just break it down learn learn your sections and then eventually you'll go there and everything will look familiar and you can really pick what you want to do that day based on your past history or what the you know what the weather's looking like do you have any bucket list items you're going to try to complete this coming year yeah i want to i want to break like 20 i want to get like a 26 pound bag on Anna because I know it's possible I think that's like one of my fishing things uh this year because I saw the potential there and I had uh I think my best bag best bag in a tournament was like 18 19 something and the best bag just like it was literally like a random day after work I had like 24 and a half or something damn on Anna and like three hours of fishing so I was just like okay like I'm gonna I want to try to get like a 26 27 I know the 30 is possible. I don't, I don't think it's going to be me. It's probably going to be it's going to be one of these dudes in the winter. I'm pretty sure that fished it a lot. But uh, but yeah, I think that's like a Lake Anna goal for me. It's 26 there. Um, went to New York this past summer. That was a bucket list thing. Finally did that. So oh cool. Where'd you go? So that's off the list. Uh, Lake Chautauqua and Lake Erie. Oh um, my god, Chautauqua. I yeah. I remember that place. Yeah, it's it was different. Man. I got there and I was like, "What the hell is it? Like, I have never seen a fishery like this in my life." But it was cool. I mean, if you wanna, if you are having a hard time catching fish in Virginia, just go to New York. If you can, go to New York, and you you will be the best angler, the best angler ever in your mind for that day because it is it's catching. It's not fishing. It's... If you can cast the rod, you'll catch fish. Oh my God, Lake Chautauqua. That brings back some freaking memories. If, if we're thinking about the same place, upstate New York, oh, all right, let's just find this thing real quick. Yeah, it's like the western part. It touches right by Lake Erie, I believe. I think that we're right, right there. Yep, yep, that is it. Yeah, we fished two college tournaments there, I think. Maybe it was three that we ended up fishing up there. And that was back when the, we had the FLW college tour. And and they were regional. Like, um, they would send you all over God's earth. And that place really got me sized for what fishing can be when you have a lot of aquatic vegetation 
and then <laughs> yeah. it freezes like six months out of the year. It, it, yep. it, it's insane. And how every ounce counts. Um, and, and guys, if you think dock fishing is fun down here, up there, when they're on docks, it's stupid. It's absolutely yeah, stupid. It's just cheating. It's not, I swear, you don't even feel like you're fishing when you grow up somewhere. And like in the Virginia down south, and you know, there's some other places, it's like fishing's hard <laughs> up there. And it's like you're, you're catching fish all day. What was your what was your PR smallmouth from that trip? Oh, like probably. I honestly, it wasn't. I didn't get like the big, big one I wanted. I'm probably gonna go up to Thousand Islands in the next year to Ooh. try to do that. But I caught like a, a four pound smallmouth on like the first day we were there. On um, you, but it, Erie or Chautauqua? On Chautauqua, Chautauqua. yeah. It was which I, we thought it was gonna be Erie because like on Erie it was like a numbers thing. We would just catch a bunch, nothing, uh, nothing of size. It was like a bunch of two pounders and stuff. So it was fun. And then Chautauqua, it was like, oh, this dock post is a large mouth. That next one's a small mouth. And it was it was fun. That's what's so cool about those those glacier finger lakes. It just like guys like Lake Champlain is the biggest example where it is like you could literally skip a dock and you could catch a small mouth. You could catch a large mouth and either one will win there. Like there are so many lakes where it's either a large mouth or small mouth win. Those are mixed bag lakes where you can't really focus in on just one to have success. Yeah, that's how it seemed there because it was like you'd even go off a little bit deeper and try to like mark some stuff, some more like smallmouth looking stuff where you, you'd find like the hard cover um, there. That seemed to be like the thing. There was a lot of vegetation, but then you would find like the things where it's broken up by like chunk rock or something. And that and you, that's usually where you got most of your bites. And then you'd be like catching two smallmouth and then you catch a large mouth. And you're like, oh, OK, I guess they're probably just like schooling all together, feeding on the same stuff, same time. It's like they it was really cool because here. Like a, from like Smith Mountain standpoint, like when you go to catch smallmouth on Smith Mountain, like there's a specific area that you go to do that. And here it was like they're just everywhere. They're just everywhere. Yeah, exactly. God, now I'm looking at freaking like <clears throat> I'm saying, um, looking at freaking St. Lawrence right now. I that thing is a weird cat too, man. Like it's not like the Upper Potomac. That shit's got water flowing through that thing real quick, and it is deep. It is so cool though. Yeah, I'm looking forward to getting up there. That's definitely in the next year or two. I got to get up there. Would you rather catch a world record smallmouth or largemouth? Or, or... Um, I mean, if it was a world record largemouth, that would be like 20-something pounds. And then smallmouth, it's probably like 11-ish or something around there. I don't know. That's hard. The fight with the smallmouth would probably be 10 times better than the 20-whatever-some-pound largemouth. But I think having like just holding like a 23s, whatever it is, pound large mouth would almost be kind of comical. So Yeah, I think that'd be <laughs> it, it's so weird. I'd rather hold the large mouth, but the idea of, of sticking like I think I, I read an excerpt from the guy that just caught a 10 pounder on Lake Erie. And he said like a, it was like a 20 to 30 minute fight. Oh, yeah. With that thing like that's Please. like, yeah, that would be like just so much freaking fun to do that. Um I mean, Tyler, we've covered a lot of things this, this, this evening, and I, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Is there anything else that we should touch on or that, that you'd like to mention or anything like that? Um, yeah, just one thing. I know that, uh, you know, if you have any young listeners and stuff, just stick stick to it. Um, whenever fishing doesn't get fun, just kind of reevaluate what you can do to make it fun. If competitive fishing isn't fun, you can make content. You can go fishing just for fun. For me, fishing is like a mix of competition and therapy of just uh, something to get out there and do. So, you know, you can get burnt out, um, but don't let it, don't let it ever do that to you. And if it does just kind of reevaluate and, and find different ways, there, there's a ton you can do with fishing. Um, but yeah, that that's it. That's all. And, you know, I appreciate you having me for sure. No, dude, absolutely. And, and thank you so much for reaching out. Again, if you guys want to be on the show, just yeah, feel free to reach out to me. We can kind of make it work. And, and I just want to like, add on to what Tyler said, like, yeah, it doesn't have to just be like fishing BFLs and stuff. You could go be multi-species. You could try just to learn one technique. Like this, this year, I just spent most of my time fishing with BF, BFS gear, just trying to figure that stuff out and see what the biggest fish is I could jack on an ultra light bait caster. Um, and that was fun. It got me kind of re, re revamped in it. So yeah, there, there's so many ways you can have fun in this sport and it doesn't necessarily have to be like high end tournament fishing and, and you can enjoy yeah. it and get out on the water. Yeah, for sure. And with that, there's no there's no cheat codes because I I mean you can we we're lucky with like the internet and on like for me it was like internet magazine so I learned a lot, but it is and it's cliche and everyone says it just just time on the water especially if you're younger time on the water 
if you have like that drive to do that and spend the time in the water, you're gonna you're gonna see it. You're gonna go out there and, and catch a lot more than you're you know wishing you were. No, a hundred percent. Yeah, yep, that is yeah. so so freaking true, dude. Tyler, again, thank you so much. I really appreciate you guys for coming on the show. A link in the episode description, guys, to all of the social media. Please give him a follow. It would really help him out. Give it a like to this channel too. It really helped me out. And we'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Aarons and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.